Hi, Paul here from Easy Composites with an introduction to a really exciting series of video tutorials where we're making the lightest and most indestructible sledges we can for a North Pole record attempt called the Dark Ice Project. With me here, I have the expedition coordinator, Alex Hibbert. And Alex, could you tell us a bit more about the Dark Ice Project and what you and the team want to get out of it? Sure, so I've been running projects in the Arctic now for well over a decade, and the Dark Ice Project itself is something which I came up with as a concept in around 2012, and I've done a few preparatory expeditions and, and training trips to try and work out what it's like to work in the polar winter. That's when the sun is below the horizon okay. for the entirety of the trip. And so we're now at the point where we're, we're ready to launch, we're ready to go this winter onto the ice to do a, a two-part expedition. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's going to be a science survey looking at microplastics and a load of other um, bits of work that hasn't been done on the Arctic, Arctic Ocean in the winter and then an exploratory goal which is trying to reach the North Pole without resupply on our own in the dark. Okay and so how long is this trip taking again? It's going to take a while it's going to be the longest one I've done so far so around six months it's going to be uh, the early phase is going to be based on an expedition HQ boat and then we are released from the boat and then we do the ski phase uh, living in the tent every night. Okay so you're actually waiting for the sort of ice float to form around you um, in the boat initially. Exactly, rather like it was done 150, 200 years ago with the early explorers, we're going to be locking the boats into the ice pack, um, basing ourselves there for most of the science work and some of our, and obviously still training because we need to be fit and strong when we start the, the main ski phase. And then yes, we then head off to the, to the North Pole. Uh, hopefully our compasses will be set correctly. And, uh, and then the boat itself will be released uh, one or two seasons later into, we hope, the Atlantic Ocean to be recovered. As you just heard, this is a really exciting project and one that's very difficult not to get drawn into, which is what happened to us. Alex was going to be making these sledges himself, but as we were talking over our technical support email, I got interested in the project and thought we'd take it on and take you guys along for the ride. Uh, so you brought a sledge along with you. Tell us about this one. That's right. So this was my sledge on my first really big expedition called the Long Haul. And uh, it's designed for ice cap use. And so that's why it's a little bit lower than the ones that you would normally have for use on, on sea ice, uh, because it doesn't need to be rocked around quite so much. And it's a glass fibre one at the time. My, my budget was limited and okay. uh, glass fibre was all I could afford. And it's, it's really heavy. That said, it survived 15... Uh, 100 miles plus yeah. of, of tortuous Arctic ice. So um, actually it's done pretty well, I think. Um, but it's, uh, it's a different shape than the one that we're going to be working on. Okay, well, I mean, glass is a really underestimated material. Um, you know, it does, does have some excellent properties. Okay, it might not be the very best, but I fully understand why it might be a suitable material for this. But the prototypes you made last year, um, they were made from Dylan. Um, tell us what your decision on that material selection was and how you went about the construction. Well, I've been, I've been tinkering around for years with lots of different uh, materials, uh, sort of self-taught from your website. And what I was trying to do is find something that was light, um, so using low density uh, reinforcements. But in particular, I was attracted by the low el elongation to break from the, the dial in because I thought that it could withstand serious impact. So I was looking at it as an alternative to Kevlar, which is the, the normal modern sledge mm -hmm. uh, making material. So these dial in prototypes, how did they hold up? They did really well. So we took them to Canada at the beginning of the year and they were made late last year in preparation for that training trip. They were absolutely fine all the way down to minus 45 degrees, but they weren't given as much of a, of a pummeling on the ice as we would have liked. So actually at the end, we, we, we got a sledgehammer and did a little bit of extra testing yeah. to find out what would make them fail. And so we thwacked them on all sides and all the corners and all the, and, and all the different panels. Uh, but in general, we were very happy with, with, the, with the dial-in. It's a yep. remarkably, uh, incredibly flexible material, and we weren't able to, uh, to make the, the, the middle flex or sag. Right, yeah, well, it certainly, certainly makes dial-in a very strong contender for, for this application, and I, I can see why you went down that route. There's, there's a few sort of fibres that come into this, that category. So you've got yeah, your dial-ins, negras, Kevlar, as, you, as you've just suggested. Um, and they're, they're all very well known for having high impact strength. And my initial instinct on this, would that would be an appropriate choice. If we look over the sledge itself, we're going to be redesigning this, obviously. You've mentioned that this is a lot shallower than the, the sledge that we're going to be making. But what other changes to the geometry and the design do you need to make? Well, they're going to be roughly the same length because we need to have the same very high capacity for a multi-month expedition. Uh, the entire thing needs to be higher, and particularly at the nose, so it can go over large chunks of ice yep. um, without getting uh, embedded in, in, uh, in obstacles. Okay. And we also need it to be higher at the sides so it can float across leads. The leads are the, the water gaps in between the ice flows. And we need to rough them together sometimes or, or use them individually to get across from one ice flow to the next. 
next. So the uh, where where are you while these are floating in the water? Either dragging it across, wearing an immersion suit, sw swimming in front of it. Sounds or, horrendous. Or sitting on top with a shovel, using the, the shovel as a paddle. So that's how you normally get across from one ice floe to the next. Okay. Well, that, and that's in the dark. That's in the dark, yeah. And what sort, what sort of water temperatures? Uh, water temperatures, it's going to be hanging around zero, just below zero. But of yep. course, the second you get, you get out again, you're then back into yeah. the air, which is down to minus 45. Okay, well, <laughs> rather you than me. Um, <laughs> if we look now at um, the, flip it, shall we flip it over and have a look at the, the base, which is the primary molding in the part? From this, I can straight away see these runners. Presumably, they are polyethylene runner. Yeah, ultra high molecular weight. Yeah, yep. so the, the same material that you find on the base of a snowboard. What changes would, are we making to the design from this? Well, because we're looking at use on sea ice, you want to have your weight set a little bit lower for stability because the sledge is more likely to be rocked around. And so I, I call these the feet. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's quite, a big, uh, quite a big rise here for the, for the feet. Um, we're making that shallower. Okay. Um, and also, the sledge is, is also going to be slightly wider, again, for the same stability. Uh, but in terms of the, uh, the general makeup of the sled, a nice smooth bottom, of course, so that if it does catch the snow, it's going to be as low friction as possible. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had a little bit of researching around, and, and you have as well. Um, the different surface coatings for, um, for making the, the sort of the base material or the gel coats that we've got here, um, when I've looked into um, the different materials, there's very, very little information on sort of the coefficient of friction between ice, snow, and various composite surfaces. Not that surprising. Um, it's a bit niche. It is, it is a little bit niche. Um, what, uh, what have you discovered or what have you seen other manufacturers using for this? Um, there's a little bit of secrecy that goes around. I've, I, in, the, in the polar industry, generally, when people have come up with a, a really good plan, they don't tend to share it around too much. Um, but there are some coatings that people have used, that which we, we, we think is involving some graphite. Um, and we were also looking at the possibility of, of using um, uh, ground plastics as well, which might be low friction. But okay. that's, uh, that's a very, um, it's, it's something which hasn't really been tested. Well, certainly I can, see, I can see there might be some logic in using graphite because it is commonly used as a bearing surface um, and, yeah, might well, might well have an influence over the friction. So that's something, something definitely interested in testing. Um, and then in terms of the actual structural strength, what are the key attributes that you need from this? What, what are the, is it stiffness? Is it the impact resistance? So the three things that we really need to be on point is, first of all, impact resistance. So if yep. you smack into a piece of ice at the front, it needs to be able to withstand that and not hold so that you don't have water pouring in mm -hmm. when you cross the next lead. It needs to be as light as possible because I'm going to be hauling this for a very, very long way. So I want to save as much weight as I possibly can. But also it needs to be stiff enough to re retain its shape when it's got a huge load inside it. Okay. So it's balancing up those three things yep. um, and not prioritizing one too much over another. Okay, and of course, you just mentioned then the nose of the, the sledge, is that where the, the brunt of the impact is occur? Yeah. Unless you're doing something very daft, the side and the rear is not going to get too much, of, um, uh, too much uh, abuse. It's mainly the nose if you have to drop off a, a large pressure ridge of ice and it essentially goes nose first with yep. hundreds of kilos inside straight onto its nose. Yep. It needs to be strong there. Uh, and also it's what I call a, a, a belly flop. If the sledge lifts up over a rise and then thwacks down onto a sharp piece of ice, it needs yep. to be protected here as well. Right. Okay. So we'll focus certainly most of the reinforcement into that, into that front area. How much, how much weight do you have, are you carrying in these sledges? Uh, I, I've had well over 240 kilos inside a sledge. So 240 kilos, that is a lot of load. And if we've got this situation here where this is just spanning across, that sort of load could easily sag the bottom. So I, I, we're gonna have to try and make sure we've got sufficient reinforcement here, probably with a core material, I will imagine. To summarize, what we've really got to be doing here is we've got to look at the gel coat surface and find the lowest friction surface we can. We're also going to need to decide what reinforcement is going to offer us the best sort of compromise or balance between impact resistance and stiffness. Um, and then in terms of the geometry, we're changing the sort of the floor. So we're going to lower that to lower your center of gravity. And we're also going to make these sides, sides deeper and overall wider. Um, are there any other changes in the geometry you'd like to make? There's one other thing. When you're punching through large areas of, of deep snow, yeah. it's actually a good idea to try and make a, a hole that's slightly bigger than the rest of the sledge. So using the shoulders to be slightly wider than the rest of the body, that means that once it's punched that hole all the way through, mm -hmm. the snow isn't then causing friction all the way along the side. Okay, that does make perfect sense. I'll do some designs on that and send them across to you to see what you think. Thanks a lot for coming down and having a chat to us today, Alex. Really looking forward to getting started on this project. If you want to follow along, we'll be doing a series of videos starting with the design and the pattern making, then going on to make the mold, 
before doing some materials testing where we're going to test for friction and impact resistance. And then finally, we'll go on to do the resin infused part. If people want to find out more information about the expedition, where can they find that? The easiest thing is just to search for the Dark Ice Project and all of our social media and our website will come up. If you want to follow us along in our small part in this journey, hit subscribe and we'll see you in the next tutorial where we'll get started making the pattern.